Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Ola Dawi. I'm a grad student uh, in Global and Area Studies program and I'm uh, from Tunisia. Today my topic is entitled Tunisian Women Chanted. A Tunisian woman is a woman and a half. This slogan is taken from a march that Tunisian women uh, had um, in order to, to show their disapproval of what is happening in Tunisia in terms of women's rights. And this picture is taken from a Tunisian website where you can see men and women in one hand, they're together, in the other hand, they're seeing who's going to be the winner. Um, are we equal? Are we not equal? So let me first take you into uh, the roadmap. I'll be first given a small background, um, second, the research question, um, overview of my field work, and brief analysis of the data that I had before and after the revolution and the issue of parity and complementarity in the Tunisian constitution of 2014, and finally, concluding remarks. Tunisian women before the revolution had a lot of rights protecting her, specifically through the constitution of Tunisia and the code of personal status. Also, Tunisia signed a lot of treaties, um, basically the CEDAW, the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in the 1980s, and we also ha we have the United Nations Convention on Women's Rights in the 1985. Um, with all that, with one of my interviews in Tunisia, she said that both presidents that we had, the only two presidents that Tunisia had after independence, which are Brigiba and Ben Ali, used women to showcase to the outside world an image that they have been cultivating, which serves as a facade to impress the West and as a way to showcase in front of the world. So basically, for her, these two presidents chose the women, chose those rights. They wanted to support women just to tell the world we are a kind of um, improving country. We are like those progress countries. But for her, um, these are only for the secular parties, whereas the um, Islamist parties or anybody with a religious orientation was basically imprisoned, tortured, alienated, um, and some of them, like, they were sent into exile. Let me now talk about the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring started with Mohammed Bouazizi. He was a street vendor, and he was selling in the street without a license. And with, when the municipality officer, Fadi Hamid, this is her picture after the revolution, um, she asked him for if he has papers, but he didn't. So she confiscated his scale. He was very upset, and he started saying bad things to her, so she was very upset, and she slapped him, and she spit on him, and he was even more upset, so he went to the governor to complain about this, and the governor refused to meet with him. So what he did, he just immolated himself in fire, and he burned himself to death. Um, with that story, Tunisian people, like, they felt this. They felt this in every person, because his situation is the situation of every Tunisian, of a lot of youth in Tunisia who doesn't have jobs, and this is the only way of surviving. Go to the street and sell something. This is how the revolution started in Tunisia. With an interview with Basmat al Nasri, she's a lawyer, she was defending uh, the municipality officer, Fadi Hamid, and she said something very interesting, and I thought, like, I can mention this, this is very important to my topic. And she said, the revolution didn't start by a man who was breaking the law, but rather by women who was implying the law, who was using the law here. And I thought, like, this can change how people see the revolution, a revolution started by women and not by a man. Soon after what happened in that city, in Sidi Bouzid, with that guy, everything started to spread to the, to the whole country and then started to spread all over the Middle East. And you heard about the Arab Spring. We have here this picture. Every president started to fall after the other. And this is the president, the ex-president of Tunisia. He said, I understood, understood, I understood. And the president after him of Egypt, he said, I understood too. And then Libya is like, I swear I understood too. So this is kind of funny that all these presidents start to understand the situation of their people only after the revolution when those people start to revolt against them. The reason why I chose this topic is I was, I was there in Tunisia during, during this revolution. And I was then an undergrad student in um, College of Arts and Sciences in Sfax. And I thought, this is the story that I can talk about. This is the story I can talk about as a participant, as an observer, and I needed to talk about the role of women, how women were there, their efforts, um, how they were side by side to men 
just like fighting for equality, fighting for democracy. With an interview with Rabia Sleiman, she's a trade unionist from Sidi Bouzid, she said, I was side to side with men in the first and second marshes on the Kasbah, which is the seat on the government where all the government buildings are. Um, in Tunis, we have spent days and nights in the capital. People like sleep there. We actually sleep in the street. Um, I was in tears when I was there. So overwhelming was our feeling of victory over an oppressive regime. Each one of those who marched in the Kasbah felt the leader in him or her. I felt this is the feeling of every Tunisian, especially when um, everybody starts saying that the present ran away, which is after this is how the revolution succeeded. Let me now talk about the field research that I had. I had my field research the past summer of 2014 for two months and a half in Tunisia. Tunisia is situated in the North African countries. Um, see Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. These are the North African countries. And we have the Mediterranean Sea and Europe in front of us. So I did my research in four different cities in Tunisia. The first city was Tunis, the capital. The second city is Sfax, which is the first economic capital. Um, Sidi Bouzid, which is supposed to be here, which is the cradle of the revolution where the revolution started. And Gafsa, which is a neighboring city. And I had 40 interviewees from different political parties, from the extreme left to the extreme right to the selfie right. And I had semi-structured interviews and folks groups. My research question, the first research question is, how did Tunisian women civically engage in their quest for equality during and after the revolution of 2010? And with a specific reference to the notion of parity and complementarity that I will be explaining in a minute, to what extent did women manage to achieve their quests and needs in the first and second drafts of the constitution after the revolution? So parity, in two words, which means total equality between men and women, and complementarity is uh, Men and women have different biological roles. That's why they um, complement each other. Um, this issue came in the first draft of the Tunisian constitution in Article 28. And this says, Tunisian men and women are equal in front of the law, but complementary in the house. And this clause, complementary in the house, triggered a lot of heated debates. And people started questioning, what do you mean about complementary here? For those who were supporting parity, the groups that were supporting parity were basically the left parties and were basically, we can say, the secular parties. Um, we can mention some of them like the ATFD, which is the Tunisian Association of Democrat Women. And with an interview with Najwa Bakar, she's the ex-president of this um, association, she said, my ideology is the adoption of the human rights and democracy, equality, separation of powers and separation of religion from politics in order to have civil state and total equality between men and women. So for her, in, or in order that women and men are equal, we should adopt a kind of international or the United Nations concept of equality. And this picture triggered a lot of other heated debates. So for, her, for them, in order for women to be like totally liberated, she should take off all kind of covers, um, and um, the culture aspect, the religious aspect, all of them, all of those are considered kind of part of this dark hand, like they are under um, kind of um, darkness. And this one, this woman is saying basically no question um, to return to darkness. Basically people, when they saw it, was like, what do you mean about this? Do you mean that we should forgot about our culture? Do you mean that we should forget about religion? Is that what you mean about women in order to liberate? This is the picture that you should see, that you want to see. And this is basically what the left and the right party were fighting about. The complementary camp were basically the religious parties. We have the Nahda party, and I had an interview with a member of parliament. And she said, why the two sexes are created equal under God, they nevertheless remain distinctive in, term, distinctive in term of their biological roles and family obligation. So the complementary aspect that they see here is that women and men are different biologically, and thus um, they have different roles. And another interview, she explained that women 
are equal to men in all terms. However, they are innately positioned regarding motherhood and more nurturing responsibility within the nuclear family unit. So women and men are different because women give birth, women can breastfeed the children, but the man cannot do this. So this is what we meant with complementary. After debates and the final draft of the Constitution came out, they changed it, they took off this complementary aspect and they said Tunisian women and men are equal in front of the law. And when I asked the secular parties, what do you think about this? What do you think about what's happened now? You have now this clause that you were craving for. And they said, this is a total success for us. We got what we wanted. And when I asked the religious parties, which at that time they were the ruling party, they said, our government is democratic. The people by majority chose the equality clause over complementarity. We changed it based on the people's will. And they think this is a kind of success. And specifically that the complementary clause had a lot of diff different interpretation, like negative interpretations, and they don't want that to be in the Constitution. To conclude, women's voices were very powerful no matter what their um, orientation. There are complete gender empowerment, um, socially, economically, politically, and culturally. Um, and there is, most importantly, the change from um, a top-down politics model to a bottom-up. What I mean about this, that all the rules, all the laws that were protecting women before the revolution, they were coming from one person, which is the president. But now, after the revolution, um, civil society, people, women in the streets, um, anybody is revolting to change this. Thus, the politics is changing from down and it's going up. So um, I thought this is very important to mention. Now I want to thank the generous support of the University of Wyoming and the donors. We have the Dick and Lynn Cheney Study Abroad Fellowship, Social Justice Research Award, Global Area Studies, and Joni Logan International Studies Research Excellence Fund. Um, I won't be able to do my research. Thank you so much.